Well, that's right. <laughs> I forgot that I'm supposedly in charge. Uh, I'm. Uh, we're going to be. Uh, we're. Uh, our meeting today is is completely about uh, Dr. Anika Burton, and I will throw it over to Alistair so that we can listen to her wisdom and then we can grill her. <laughs> unlike unlike what they do with cicadas, <laughs> and that's that's grill in a good way. Uh, th 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 thank you for the introduction, <laughs> Fraser. Sure. Um, no, I'm so ex I'm so excited about this conversation, and uh, with with both of you, Fraser and Ebony Rose, I think, um, and, and John Paul, uh, we can think together. Uh, if I may, just start at the end, actually, um, of <laughs> the last conversation that Dr. Kelly and Dr. Burton and I had, and then we can pass over to them because I think there's a lot to learn about in, in terms of what they're doing, but I just want to make sure that we have the same goal in mind. And the last conversation that I got to have with the two of you, we ended with the vision, right, that uh, UDC's fantastic literacy team, training team, could help uh, DCPS students and DC public charter school students, uh, excuse me, teachers who need credentialing um, who are uh, on the borderline of, you know, having uh, their, their students are not achieving the outcomes that they could be or um, uh, or interested in getting a full master's program that that we could build a more formal pipeline in partnership with UDC um, to, to get that extra uh, uh, science based uh, and evidence based training. Um, if, uh, if Dr. Kelly, Dr. Burton, that seems like the right vision to be working towards, I'll pass over to you. And if you're willing to catch, um, to, to introduce yourselves to, I, I don't actually know if you've worked with uh, Ebony Rose and, and Fraser in the past, they've both, uh, great, okay. Um, uh, been, uh, you know, uh, are, are, are already, uh, even before joining the board have been in our change makers within the education space here. Um, and so I think, if you're willing to just introduce yourselves to them first and, and uh, share a bit about your work, but with that goal in mind, so we have some time to work together on how we actually, what, what our options are to get towards that vision. Okay, we're always like, who's going to, going to go first in this? <laughs> Rock, paper, scissors, okay. Well, good evening, everyone, again. Um, I am Ayana Kelly. I'm a clinical professor at the University of the District of Columbia. This is my ninth year there. Prior to coming to UDC, I was a teacher in DCPS and then at a public charter school in DC. Um, throughout my career, I have always um, done teaching around literacy, um, especially when I became an instructional coach. Uh, one of my main goals was to assist and instruct curricular changes for literacy in order to assist students who were struggling with reading and also beginning readers. Um, at UDC, I teach across the graduate early childhood MA program and also in the undergraduate yeah. education program with literacy courses. Okay, hi everybody. Um, my name is Anika Spratley Burton. I am currently the chair of the Division of Education, Health and Social Work. Um, Dr. O'Leary, I, I was in a meeting with you a while back when we were working on that um, survey about teacher uh, retention um, a while, that was a while ago. Um, I am a former high school English teacher, uh, have taught all over the country, trained all over the country. Um, used to work with Ayana with a public charter school in DC as well. So we're now joined at the hip. We, we have to work together wherever we go from now until. Um, so in terms of UDC, I joined as just a regular professor, but since that time I've sort of moved up in the ranks and the whole time sort of crafting and refining our master's program. Um, and really always looking to strengthen the pipeline of teachers that are going into DCPS. But like Ayana said, uh, both she and I have literacy backgrounds. Uh, a large majority of our faculty actually have literacy backgrounds. And so we build that into a lot of our courses. Um, and we, while the rest of the world is very, very STEM crazy, um, which is nice, uh, we are still holding the literacy pipeline 
um, and very much invested in making sure that um, teachers are prepared to deal with uh, whatever literacy challenges they face, because we really do see that as the cornerstone. Um, we're a little biased, um, but that's sort of where we, we stake our claim. Uh, Ayana being more so, sorry, more so the uh, younger grades, pre-K through five, and my specialty being struggling adolescent readers, um, so middle school on up. Uh, so yeah, we are definitely interested in any conversations um, that could lead to uh, working with those who want to go into teaching and those who already are. I was explaining to Alistair when we last met, UDC fills a sort of very unique niche in um, DC where a lot of our students come to us already in schools. So they're either already teachers of records or they are teachers of record or they're paraprofessionals seeking to become teachers or their aides. Um, so whereas a lot of the other programs are getting people sort of fresh out of you know whatever program, um, a lot of our people have actually been teaching a while and, and we take great pride in working with people who are already in classrooms, um, whereas some programs will turn them down. We kind of take it on as our mission. Like if they're already working with kids, let's make sure that they're doing what we believe is right for kids as opposed to turning them away and not knowing what's going on um, in those classrooms. So um, we are very much already invested in DCPS and a lot of our students are DCPS graduates um, and they are very interested in going back to um, their neighborhoods, the classrooms, the schools that they came from and making a difference. So um, we, we already sort of have a direct pipeline, but if we could sort of advertise and market and streamline and, and bring people together in a very systematic fashion, um, we would definitely be interested in that. Yeah. yeah, and also through our MOU with DCPS, um, as part of our partnership work, we also go into schools if principals need to support teachers already. Mm -hmm. um, and so we've done professional developments around literacy. We've gone in and did um, reading workshops for certain schools. So it all depends on um, our partnership with the school, and what their needs are. So we've also done that as well. Yeah. That's that's just a wonderful introduction. Um, <laughs> you know, you know, I'm I'm already a, a convert since, even though uh, y'all are very experienced. I taught for 47 years in the English class, mm -hmm. trying to get my students to read, and that's what I do, still do at UDC, and I'll be doing it in the summer bridge program this summer for UDC, and it's about writing and reading, and. Um, uh, I, I don't know uh, about your definition of a regular professor. <laughs> That's like uh, just I'm just a teacher. With, right. uh, those don't make sense at all. I know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, my wife was a Head Start teacher, and um, uh, so teaching teaching teachers how to teach reading and teaching students how to read go hand in hand. And if you have both of the if you have educators that know how to teach reading and you have students that want to learn how to read, then you have an educational system, which is the best in the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm, I'm just so excited that UDC has these uh, fabulous programs and is the highest rated university in the metropolitan area as far as literacy uh, is concerned. And, I, and when you talked about advertising, that's the, I mean, UDC has, has never been looked at as a, um, a bellwether of education in the city. It's always been looked at, I won't say, I, ne I never used the word stepchild because uh, I, I think that's a bad term, but uh, it's always looked at in not the most positive ways. And I think that for people to know that UDC has this, label of being the the bellwether i think that's very important and we'll do everything we can to get the word out um if it means y'all coming back on a panel to talk to us about it then then you're going to be penalized if there's such a word <laughs> uh 
because it's so important and it's it's what education is all about. If you can't read, you can't be smart, period. You can be street smart and you can be smart like we have relatives. My, my grandmother made it to the fourth grade, I think. And she wasn't educated, but she was really intelligent. But as far as making it in the world, you need to be able to read, bottom line. And um, so we need to know what we can do on the state board to wake up the people in the education system, both the charters and the and DCPS to the absolute importance of literacy. You know, they talk about STEM and all these other things, but you can't do STEM if you can't read. You know, there is no STEM without the roots, <laughs> pardon me. And, and, we, and reading is the roots. I might even quote myself with that. I'll, I was going to say, maybe I said, we, we said we're going to get a t-shirt. <laughs> yeah, but, but people uh, say that so, we're, we're biased to literacy because that's our well, that's, that's interest, a, that's, but I'm like, I'm, I'm okay with that because yeah. I know. That's the, best, <laughs> that's the best bias in the world because Alistair and Ebony Rose know that I have a, um, <clears throat> I collect books for the schools mm -hmm. uh, in Ward 4 for the elementary schools, basically. And um, and we've collected over 30,000, we've delivered over 30,000 books in the last year and a half to the elementary schools in the in Ward 4. And I know that Alistair and Ebony Rose are gonna start that Mrs. O'Leary's Books for Friends in their wards too, right? I have another partnership that might work for you also. Oh, great. Well, yeah, I, I'll put, yeah. uh, if you don't, I'll put all my stuff in the chat. Uh, but I, but I, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna be quiet and let and let y'all talk. Um. Um, Ebony Rose, I'd love your first reactions too, and then and then uh, uh, would love to kind of dig into some of the options. No, I mean I'm just happy to listen at this point. Um, I'm I'm looking forward to digging into the options. Okay. So. Um, and, and this is where I think uh, uh, your um, feedback, John Paul, would also uh, be helpful in terms of just thinking through, you know, what the board has done in the teacher pipeline work so far, um, where we are in that. And, um, uh, and I think um, uh, actually, that that would help set the the stage for for this conversation. Um, if, if you're willing to share what's worked, what ha I mean, what have, what have we been when doing so far, and how how uh, what have we learned? Sure. I mean, I think in general, you know, the boards like ours, the state boards in, uh, around the country, have sort of three main levers of power, right? Um, the lever to approve policies and regulations. Um, the levers to represent the people and the re and the lever of, of public meetings or you know bringing things to the public and I think each of those levers can be pulled in different ways and I think especially for for uh, as a, you know a good example of how we have, have impacted other agencies uh, to to do more to do different things um, is is their teacher retention work um, you know there has been a lot you know our report in 2018 was the first time, that anyone put all the data together. I mean, the data was there. It was just a matter of putting it all together to show that we had, um, you know, a massive problem with with teacher uh, uh, retention. And so, I think this is one of those opportunities too that that it is so foundational um, to student learning of all in, in all areas that that I think it makes a lot of sense for the state board to really be uh, one of the leaders here. And I think. Um, Alistair, I think you're doing the right thing in terms of bringing the experts together, especially those those local experts that we that we have um, through UDC to to figure out. Okay, so what is what are potential barriers? You know, what are the things that our teachers are are uh, have a barrier on in order for them to get this uh, instruction? What are the things that we need to be promoting beyond that? You know, what are the things that UDC is doing so well? that we can encourage other universities and colleges um, that are supplying our teachers to adopt, to think about, to do those types of things. How do we, how do we um, you know, go beyond sort of our borders and our authority there 
um, through use of our, our national associations or through our connections with other states or through the DC TAG programs or through the HBCU networks? Like, how do we make sure that all of them um, have, have access to this, right? Um, there are some really fantastic organizations that, that, I'm, that I know UDC is, is, is part of in terms of the land grant universities and public universities. How do we activate that network um, to, to really talk to those major universities and say, this is what you can learn from, from us. We, we have a really good program, learn it, like take it out. Um, because one of the things that we've been challenged on um, with working with, um, with our education preparation program standards, that is something that OSSI is gonna be uh, bringing to the board for approval sometime this fall, is it only, it only applies to schools in the district. And most of the teachers that are, that are new don't come from DC-based institutions. So we need to make sure that we're, we're doing it right here as an example to, for others to, to learn. So I think this, this conversation is gonna be very helpful for that. John Paul, may I ask you actually to, um, one thing that I had spoken about with Dr. Burton and Dr. Kelly uh, in our last conversation um, concerned, I, I raised that President Parker is interested in developing the pipeline of local teachers. And I, I didn't have more, much more to, to share with them at that time on, on where we are with that. Um, yeah, I think, I think, you know, it's, it's pretty clear from, uh, from evidence around the country that grow your own programs um, are incredibly successful. Um, and we don't really have a you know, sort of sanctioned one or, or government wide one here in DC. But I think it's something that we should look at and try to figure out how do we um, do a better job of, of bringing our students back so that they can use their example and their and their expertise with the with the local environment. Um, I think UDC makes a, a great example for that, right? Like it is our homegrown university. It is the place where our students can go and get an excellent education. So we should do um, more in our schools to promote that. Um, and I think you know the other parts too is how do we partner with um, potentially other universities, right? Um, how do we how do we activate the students at CCDC um, into some of these programs? How do we make sure that they know about them? Um, and then in in a broader sense, how do we make sure that the teaching profession in DC is looked at by students as something that they would like to take advantage of. Um, and you know, that's a much larger um, conversation, I think, than we should than we could have now. Um, okay, so I, I will just kind of uh, share a few, uh, again, pulling from our last conversation, some of the few options, some of the options that uh, I think um, may be uh, helpful to kind of unpack while we're all together. There's, um, and, and, and I think this, this inevitably gets into the question of the barriers and challenges that you raised, John Paul, right? So one, one, of, the, one of the questions that came up was um, in, our, in our last conversation was of course around funding, right? Either as scholarships for teachers or uh, funding for the program itself. And I'm I'm curious, actually, if if um, uh, Dr. Burton, Dr. Kelly, if that's something that you could speak to in terms of what the what the need currently is and um, what you're receiving, and and how how students who want to get involved, what are their options, right? And or excuse me, the, the educators who want to participate in the program, what are their options of uh, and and how, what are the barriers that they face to actually be able to participate? So I, I think that, um, you know, funding is always a big deal. We at UDC are fortunate in that one of the things we always tell everyone is we are the most affordable university in the District of Columbia. We are the only public university in the District of Columbia. Um, and our tuition structure is set that if you are living in DC, it's even more of a discount than if you are in the surrounding area. So we, we have that going for us a little bit, but we also have, um, we're evening out now where we're getting more of a traditional population, but for the most part, we're still at that non-traditional population. So we have people who have to work, you know, who we're supporting families. Like I can't just quit to go to school, you know, type thing. Um, Cause our population tends to trend a little older 
um, than other schools, even at the undergraduate level. And so typically when people apply, you know, the very first question is, got any money, got any scholarships? And we, we don't. I mean, we have very few and far between. Um, so we have some money from alumni that's set aside in a few random scholarships here and there. Um, we have a, a, a pipeline, if you will, or a funding source from the board if we can attract people who were non-education majors to go into education at the master's level. And so that's something that we're, we're working on and we're building, but um, it, it, it is an issue. And so as we think about sort of what would help, um, there are a couple of, of ways to look at it. One, there is, and Ayana, you can chime in here if you think I'm on the right track. There's, if we start with the undergraduate population, um, if, as you talk about like a grow your own and things like that, in our mind, if we could capture more of those undergrads and pull them along into the master's program, because our master's program, our MAT program is only a year. So if we could get them interested as undergrads, then take them through that additional, like a four plus one, take them through that additional year to get the pedagogy courses that they would need to then go into teaching. Um, that would be extremely helpful, but the scholarship opportunity would probably have to exist at the undergraduate level um, in order to then entice them to say, oh, you know what? If I could get money to pay for this undergraduate degree, then I'm more invested to go into this one year master's program where the university already has some funding to help with that. And then, um, you know, into the teaching force. And we, as we have sort of negotiated our MOU with DCPS, um, have asked things like, listen, when our students come out, can they get sort of first dibs on, you know, jobs? Not saying like you have to automatically hire them, but at least come to us first, you know, and, and have that interview cycle with our students first since they are from here and they're in this pipeline. If we could have some sort of partnership, like even like that, it's helpful if we can say, hey, the pool opens up on this day, but the day before that, you know, you have the opportunity to interview with, you know, whomever or however. Um, even something like that is is very helpful um, in in this uh, in this trajectory that we're talking about. So I think if there were monies at the undergraduate level that then entice students to stay to to go into teaching. Um, and then we have the one year program. That would be one of my first thoughts as to people who are already in school. The yeah. other side of that, like we said before, are people who um, are already in the teaching force where we could also be very helpful, um, whether that's through a certificate program or a set of courses that we say, hey, you know, we can run this sort of program, if you will, um, and have a cadre of teachers cycle through these classes where we're doing essentially training, but they get the credit that could help with recertification, perhaps, um, if, if they're in that pipeline of having to earn, you know, a certain number of credits to keep their um, certificate up to date. Ayana, you can jump in while I... So sorry, my dog is barking now. <laughs> I just want to add something really quickly. Uh, Dr. Burton mentioned our undergraduate population. Most of our students in an undergraduate program are paraprofessionals in DCPS or charter schools. Um, and they're coming to us because of course they want to become lead teachers. Um, something that I always think about and always ask questions about funding and their option of going to a different master's program depends on them getting a scholarship. So a lot of the non-traditional programs would subsidize their learning, but also give them funding or a stipend as they're teaching. So they wouldn't have to necessarily leave their job in order to be part of the program. Um, and so I see, um, as you guys may already know, we meet once a month as teacher preparation programs for traditional and non-traditional programs. And there's, we've been seeing a growth of non-traditional programs because they have the money and funds to support students. And if you ask students the number of reasons why they go there, it's not because they love the education, anything like that. It's because they're receiving funds to not only come to school, but also work. So really thinking about a way of how we can subsidize funding for 
while they're at UDC, but possibly as they're working as well. So kind of like a setup where they're getting a stipend to be a co-teacher, mm -hmm. where we are supporting them not only as they're learning with us, but also we're coming in and coaching them on the different practices that we see that they're doing in the classroom. Um, so I just wanted to add that part. Dr. That's Burke. kind of what I just typed in the chat. So <laughs> we know that not as eloquently as you just said it, of course, um, <laughs> but we know that that's where, when we talk about sort of market competition, that's where the competition is. Like, because mm -hmm. these alt cert programs can, they have partnerships with districts where people who are in them get paid as teachers or paras or something, then they're earning a living while they are going to school. Um, and so if we could even establish something like that where people can have funding to live because Lord, it's expensive to live in DC. Um, but if they can have funding to live while they're going to school, then it makes um, it makes us more competitive. And I think that, um, so I, I think, um, John Paul, that it's sort of a matter of, it just has to be, it would have to be set up like as, as a legitimate partnership that we could offer people to say, here's a possibility, like, you know, if you are accepted in the program, we have, you know, this many mm -hmm. slots or whatever, where you could work as a teacher while going to school, because what a lot of alternative certifications don't offer is the master's degree. So, um, or a degree at all, you know, you're just getting the certification. So there are people who really want the degree, whether that's, I want to finish a bachelor's or I want to get this advanced degree for, you know, uh, pay increase or whatever. So they're enticed by that. But if it becomes a financial situation, um, you know, so one of the reasons people also tend to like our program is because if you're already in a classroom, we work with you and your principal to make that your student teaching site, if you will. Um, I just had someone write me today who is leaving the program at Morgan because he has a full-time job and they want him to quit his job to put him in a student teaching placement. Um, we don't do that. So we have perks and benefits, but if you are a brand new person, it's a little harder to maneuver. And it really, that's where the financial implications become really important. Like if I don't already have a job and if I'm not from here or I don't have the safety net that other people have, um, I might not be able to just afford to go to school unless I can work um, full time as well. When um, when I first started teaching, uh, I, I was a student teacher. I had uh, and most of the teachers in the system were graduates of DC Teachers College when I first started. That was the early seventies, and um, now. It's not like that at all anymore. And what I'm thinking is that we need an angel. I mean, I, I was looking at, uh, I don't know if it was what college, it wasn't Morehouse, I don't think. I know Morehouse a couple of years ago, uh, the guy announced that he was gonna mm -hmm. re remove all the student debt. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it was Morehouse this year. It, it wasn't Morehouse, but it may have been Clark, uh, you know. uh, this year it was uh, Wilberforce. Okay. Wilberforce so, wiped out. But, but but all that boils. I know that I took I took the classes I needed for certification because we started out as temporary, not temporary, but it was um, what was it called? You weren't permanent. You were I guess it was temporary, but you were a temporary teacher, and you had to have courses in. One of them was a reading course, and the other was the sociology of urban youth. And, and UDC was the, offered those courses. So most of the teachers that came in when I did in the 70s became UDC, became firebirds. Uh, but, well, they weren't even firebirds yet. It was still DC teachers. But um, so what, what we need, this all has to do with getting the word out, don't you think? With something, but the, but the OSSI knows about this, but what was, what was OSSI or DCPS's answer when you ask them about that. Exactly. And so what we need to do is uh, we've got to, as Alistair and Ebony Rose know, my, my, my phrase is to 
light the fire under their feet so that we get action from the government. And I think that at this point with the city council, at least, we have friends on the city council. Uh, and it's an election year next year. So this needs to be something, and I, I've got a, uh, I think I have a pretty good relationship with President Mason, and I know how he feels about it. So I think that um, we need to uh, get the word out. Um, sounds like another panel, John Paul. <laughs> because I mean, this is, this is of extreme importance. This is the lifeblood of what reading scores are. If everybody is, I'm not a data person by any stretch of the imagination. And I don't believe, and I know that the data doesn't lie, but it doesn't tell the truth. And, um, but this is what, this is what it's all about. So we'll do, we'll, I, I'm just speaking for myself, but the royal we, I guess, uh, we'll do everything we can to get the word out and make the politicians uncomfortable enough to be comfortable with getting money in. We got all this money coming in right now from the federal government, and I still have no idea where it's going. Yeah, we, we're getting approached about certain things. So it, it was very encouraging to have you all reach out to us. Um, we, we get approached about things like, oh, can you give us students to tutor our kids? Can you give us, uh, you know, people to, like, it's always sort of this like sideline thing. And then we hear about these partnerships with other schools and I, you know, great. They, they, they've earned, you know, their reputations as well. But again, the data will show typically who stays, where they teach. Our students tend to teach in some of the, the harder wards or the tougher wards or however you want to label them. Um, like I said, because that's where they're from and they want to go back and give back. And that often gets overlooked. And I, I would love to see UDC um, sort of in part, just a genuine partnership because that's, that's what we want to do. That's what we do on a daily basis is prepare teachers to go into DC public schools and, um, and just to be looked at as a as a legitimate partner, because I keep saying, you talked about stems and roots. Everybody's stem crazy, but I give you two years tops, we're going to hit a literacy wall that a lot of us see right now, but other people don't. And then everybody's gonna be like, oh my God, what are we gonna do? And so if we could just get ahead of it now, um, we know what we need to do. We know what it takes for younger kids. And even you know, in my specialty area, we have to change things at the middle school and high school if you want to, you know, improve reading scores. And it's not test prep. It's it's not. And, and at we, all. At right, all. We teach it's our, reading. Yeah. Right. It's looking at words and books. Right. And I and, think a lot of that. Oh, I'm going through my doctoral program, so <laughs> and because like I'm always saying all these numbers. Um, <laughs> when we look at a, a lot of students that have struggled, um, a lot of the school has bought into these packaged, researched programs that they're doing in their school districts. I think we really need to start focusing on teacher prep and continuous professional development as teachers go throughout their career. And I think that's something that we do well at UDC. Um, I'm more of a, a full round coach, meaning that once you do the program, I'm still gonna email you, call you, send you articles, talk about what's happening in the classroom. And I think that what helps grow students. It's not just this one-shot professional development. You have to continuously give teachers support and strategies and data on what works well for their particular population. Um, when I'm teaching literacy, I'm like, this strategy may work one year, but it may not work the next year because you have a different set of students and teachers need to know that. They need to understand how to read the data and how to analyze it in order to choose the correct literacy program or literacy strategy in order to ensure that their students are growing and reading. And, our, and something that Dr. Burton mentioned about our teachers, we've analyzed the data too, John Paul. Um, at OSC, they've given us reports about where our students are when they graduate, how they feel about the program, if how long they've been teaching in uh, DCPS that they plan on staying. And every year we see that our, our teachers consistently stay, which I think is a great thing. I think being consistent and growing our teachers and staying with them um, would definitely benefit students as well. 
Okay, we have uh, a notice from uh, our God, uh, John Paul, uh, that we have five minutes left. Um, um, this, to me, this conversation is just beginning. I know that uh, as someone who uh, taught those students who are always looked at as not being able to pass the park test or whatever, what other garbage test that you have to take to prove that somebody's a good student. But, but I know that my students read and wrote every day, every day of the school year and their reading scores. And I use the Gates McGinnity mm -hmm. uh, test as a, as, a, as a test at the beginning of the year and, and a test at the end of the year to see where their reading levels were and taught them where they were. And at the end of the year, we, they were always three or four years above where they were at the beginning. And to me, that's what you should be looking at. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, and, but you can't be, you can't read if you don't read all the time. Right. Representative the like you just, I'm sorry. No worries. Representative Chang has his hand up and I have a thought as well. Oh, okay, I'll shut up. Thank you. I, I just, um, and I, I have, you know, I, I agree with you, Frazier. I just wanted to flag a couple of things. Um, uh, how, so how many students, how many educators do you get to train in over a, over a year? So it's a little different. Ayana, you want to talk a little bit about how the undergrad program goes and I can talk about the graduate level. Oh, you want, <laughs> Laverne and Shirley, here we go. Are you talking or you want me talking? I thought you were going to go first that you were already talking. But no, that I, didn't make sense. I was thinking undergrad. <laughs> yeah, like. um, so really quickly, the way that the undergraduate program works is that it's a traditional four-year program. The first two years of the program, our students are taking general education courses, like their foundational math, science, um, history courses. Around their sophomore year, we ask them to apply to the teacher preparation program. And what that means is that they have to submit an application to the department, um, including testing scores, because it's a licensure program where they're submitting um, a letter of recommendations, they're submitting their um, letter of intent of why they wanna become teachers, um, and then their first round of practice scores. From that, there's an interview process because we wanna make sure that they are a great fit for the students of BC when they leave our program. Once they're formally admitted to the program on their sophomore year, this is where they begin taking their METAS courses. Um, and so I would say the last time that we talked about the three reading classes that they take, um, they take a METAS and reading course just to be specific towards literacy. They take a, um, a special education course that helps them understand the data and how to support students who are struggling with literacy. And then they take one that's more specific to their content area, either for early childhood, elementary, um, or special education. So throughout those three programs, right now we have about 10 students who are actually in the teacher prep program. We have over a hundred students in a pipeline who are coming. Um, so I'll hopefully next year in spring 2022, we'll be graduating at least 10 students. And that number may sound low, it's a long backstory. I don't think we have time to talk about the undergraduate education program, but at one point it was shelved and right. we'll fall and that, to get it back. So that, that, we're This is helpful it. and I, I, I'll pass to Ebony Rose, but I, I think, um, you know, one thing when we talk with the DC Reading Clinic, um, and, you know, top of mind for me right now is Mississippi trained every single one of their reading instructors, right, in structured literacy training. And we are doing, you know, a, a couple dozen at a time, right? Um, and I, I just, I, I find, I find, I, I'm really, I feel very motivated to try to think about how we ramp that up, right, and actually build up the capacity to be able to, um, strengthen and expand that pipeline. So I'd love to come back to you about, uh, talk more about how we actually do that. Um, and you know, maybe that's through a certificate program that we build. Maybe it's actually just about you know, the, the board members communicating uh, within our boards about the opportunities that you already have. But let's, let's I, I would love if we could come back to that. And, um, uh, and I think this was a great intro call and, and, and uh, Ebony Rose, sorry, I, I took so long. I'm just going to tell you really quickly, at the graduate level, we run a cohort between 
25 to 40, just depending on the year, each year. And it's a okay. one year program. So we're cycling through that many people a year. Um, no worries. I think I, I, I would be interested and it doesn't have to be here and now, um, but I think I would be interested in better understanding what it would take um, to permit some type of partnership. I, um, my, my mom graduated from UDC as UDC's teacher program. Mm -hmm. um, and she was a non-traditional student. Mm -hmm. um, and it was financially actually very difficult to make that happen, even though UDC is, um, as we all know, the most affordable option in the district. Uh, and, and I remember her being a student teacher with DCPS. Um, I wonder if there is an opportunity, especially now, uh, to your point, um, I don't know if it's Mr. Doctor, probably Dr. Murphy. Yeah, but you um, can call me Anika, it's fine. Okay. <laughs> uh, but with the recovery, with, with, with all of the energy we're putting into response, recovery, reimagining, that conversation we're having, um, as we think about student acceleration, um, and the resources that are available around uh, that and what the best practices are, uh, both, both tied to like, you know, do you, who are the people in the classrooms and like what pedagogy are they, are they using? There is something I think that is um, both not only compelling, um, but particularly um, valuable uh, in thinking about how do you get people who not only are trained, um, but have um, an understanding of, like have the actual like cultural competency because it is their culture that is built in the, I mean, that, that particularly matters right now. Um, and so I, I do wonder if um, it's, it's terrible as this year and has been, if there's a particular opportunity now. Mm -hmm. um, yeah to think about what that looks like, even as some type of pilot, mm -hmm. uh, maybe over yeah. the next three years, uh, thinking about really what the recovery funds could be yeah. used for this, start to seed for this. Uh, that would be uh, my pitch. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, um, and maybe, and again, maybe it's an offline conversation where we start to think about like what that looks like, but, um, yeah, I think, I, I think that's the right thing. Yeah. I also, uh, and I'll say one more thing. I also um, know that when it comes to private funders, right now there is a question uh, for many of us in the education giving space around, since there is so much money in districts, um, what is it that you could or should, if anything, uh, invest in? Uh, when it comes to recovery. And so there, there's an interesting conversation happening around that in the ed giving space. Um, yeah, and so that, that also might be there, you know, there might be some shift there or some give there mm -hmm. when we think about mm -hmm. how do you leverage government funds? Yeah, there's some grant money that a colleague and I are gonna go after um, to look into eventually building uh, a black male, uh, elementary educator pipeline um, mm -hmm. because- but What funder? Well, it, right now it, it's a Spencer grant we're going after, but it, it's not at that stage yet. So this would be like preliminary work to then lead to asking for additional funds later to help build that type of pipeline. Um, There's been some good work on that with uh, at Stanton Elementary as well. <laughs> Um, in mm -hmm. building building those programs, I, I am I am very regretful to be the one who says that we do have to wrap up because we do have another meeting starting in five minutes that people are are going to start trying to join and unfortunately we're a government agency that doesn't have money so we have one account. That's fine. Um, but this is a fantastic intro conversation and thank you all for being here. Um, Dr. O'Leary, do you want to close this out? Uh, I want to uh, stick a pin in this and do it again, uh, okay. so that we'll be back in touch with both of y'all. And uh, uh, this has been fabulous, but and it's just a first step. So uh, let's keep on trucking. It's nice to have support. Thank you. We, yeah. we appreciate it, genuinely. Thank you. All. Thank you so, so much. Thank Bye -bye. you. Have a great day. Bye.